Lord be with you. And also with you. Welcome to worship <clears throat> this Sunday as we turn the page <clears throat> to a new season in the church year. <clears throat> Pardon me. It is now the Epiphany season as uh, the 12 days of Christmas have passed. Friday was the actual day of the Epiphany, and the first Sunday in the season of Epiphany is always the celebration of the baptism of our Lord Jesus Christ in the Jordan River by John the Baptist. So that's where we are today. We don't have a baptism today. The baptismal font is here as a prop for the children's talk, which will take place after the collect, collect this morning. And uh, we also today are installing our church officers, and that will take place in between the Old Testament and Epistle reading this morning. Coming up fairly soon is the coldest night of the year. Now, how would anybody know when the coldest night of the year is going to arrive? We don't. But that is a, uh, a prop that the Lockport Cares Homeless Shelter group is using for a fundraiser. It's a walkathon, and uh, the coldest night of the year, according to their calculations, must be Saturday, February the 25th, because that's when the, the walk is scheduled. What we would like to do in preparation for that is to have teams of walkers, and then of course people who sponsor those walkers, as a walkathon raises money by having sponsored walkers. Uh, we're hoping that each church will appoint a team leader and then have a team of walkers and then a greater number of people sponsoring those walkers. So let's keep that in mind. It is Saturday, February the 25th. Uh, the event starts at 4 o'clock in the afternoon and it would be great if we could put together a team of walkers for that. Let us now stand as we begin our worship this morning singing hymn 405 to Jordan's River. Thank <laughs>
Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve repentance from the front of us. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may be alive in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all of your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, You are my Son. Today I have begotten you. As for me, and I will make the nations your heritage, and the ends of the earth your possessions. You shall break them a rod of iron, and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Behold my servant, whom I have uphold, my chosen, in whom my soul delights. Glory be to God, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. In peace let us pray to the Lord. Oh, yeah. 
one Son, and anointed him with the Holy Spirit. Make all who are baptized in his name, faithful in their calling as your children, and inheritors with him of everlasting life. Through the same Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Old Testament reading for the baptism of our Lord is from Isaiah chapter 42. Behold my servant whom I uphold, my chosen in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. He will not cry aloud or lift up his voice or make it heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break and a faintly burning wick he will not quench. He will faithfully bring forth justice. He will not grow faint or be discouraged till he has established justice in the earth, and the coastlands wait for his law. Thus says God the Lord, who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and what comes from it, who gives breath to the people 
on it, and spirit to those who walk in it. I am the Lord. I have called you in righteousness. I will take you by the hand and keep you. I will give you as a covenant for the people, a light for the nations, to open the eyes that are blind, to bring out the prisoners from the dungeon, from the prison of those who sit in darkness. I am the Lord, that is my name. My glory I give to no other, nor my praise to Carvilles. Behold, the former things have come to pass, and new things I now declare. Before they spring forth, I tell you of them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. At this time, I ask all of those who have been elected or are returning in office to an office here at St. Michael, please come forward and be installed. Beloved in the Lord, Holy Scripture admonishes us that all things should be done decently and in order. To that end, the Constitution and bylaws of this congregation establish various offices to which men and women are elected and are appointed to serve. You have been chosen to fill specific offices and positions of responsibility here at St. Michael Lutheran Church. You are to work with me, the minister of word and sacrament, that our life together in Christ might be orderly and pleasing in his sight. You are to see that the services of God's house are held at the proper times, that the word of God is purely preached and taught according to the Lutheran confessions, that the sacraments of Christ are administered according to his institution, that provision is made for the Christian instruction of young and old, that the erring are admonished, and that discipline is maintained. You are to see that the temporal affairs of the congregation are properly administered, and that proper support is provided for the workers of this congregation. You are to assist in caring for the poor and the sick, in cultivating harmony among the members, in promoting the general welfare of the congregation, and in furthering the kingdom of Christ here and throughout the world. In the presence of God and of this congregation, I therefore ask you, do you accept the offices entrusted to you, and do you promise faithfully to carry out your duties, trusting in the Lord and conforming yourself to his word in accordance with the faith of the evangelical Lutheran Church? If so, then answer, I do. I do. And now I speak to the congregation at large. Beloved in the Lord, you have heard the promises of faithfulness spoken by these men and women, whom you have selected to serve in leadership. Do you promise to support them in their work, to remember them in your prayers, and to work with them to the best of the abilities that God has given you, so that he may be glorified and his work be done in our midst? If so, then answer, we do. Sisters in Christ, I now install you into your offices of St. Michael Lutheran Church in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. The Almighty and most merciful God, enlighten and strengthen you in your offices, that you may be good and faithful stewards to the glory of his name and to the good of his people. Amen. Let us pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we give thanks that you have raised up these servants for work among your people. We humbly implore you to grant them by your Holy Spirit those gifts needed to faithfully carry out their tasks, most especially wisdom, strength, and willing hearts. Let your blessing rest on this congregation, strengthen our faith, quicken our love, and ignite our zeal that your name may be glorified and that the kingdom of your Son may be advanced. We remember with thanksgiving those who have faithfully served your people and have now completed their time of service. 
We pray that in the end of days, we with all of your faithful people may hear the voice of Christ saying, Come, you who are blessed by my Father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Go now in the name of the Lord. Be steadfast, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. The Almighty and most merciful God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bless you and preserve you. for today is from Romans chapter 6. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died in, to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in, de in a death like this, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like this. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin, once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God, Christ Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand as we sing the Alleluia and verse. <laughs> as we 
sing hymn 594, God's Own Child, I gladly say it. Some had been incarcerated for petty theft or other minor offenses. 
Working closely with these individuals, Robert was able to establish a foundation of trust and respect. But one of the employees, Bill, was experiencing financial problems, and he wasn't able to resist the temptation to personally take money from the petty cash account. When a corporate official visited, she conducted an audit of the office expenses, which she sensed were not in balance. Upon further investigation, she determined that Bill had stolen a considerable amount of cash. The corporate official summoned both Robert and Bill into an office and presented the evidence of Bill's theft. There was no doubt. He was guilty. She announced that Bill's employment was being terminated and local officials were being called in order to press charges. Bill was remorseful. And Robert attempted to intervene on his behalf, but the corporate official would not listen. Recognizing that satisfaction must be made for the loss of money and that someone had to suffer the consequences for Bill's actions, Robert wrote his own personal check covering the financial loss and he volunteered to terminate his own relationship with the corporation in place of Bill. Now how would this story end in real life? Maybe the corporation would accept Robert's offer of repayment. After all, it did balance the books. Perhaps they would even consider not pressing charges against Bill. It's a stretch, but maybe they'd even let Robert stay in his management position, although most corporations would just want to remove anyone involved in this scandal and hire a fresh, unstained replacement. But there is no way this corporation is going to accept Robert's payment and his resignation only to keep Bill on their payroll. After all, Bill is an embezzler. And no mercy on Robert's part is going to remove that stain from Bill's reputation. Now, if this were a parable that accurately described the inner workings of the kingdom of God's grace, however, the corporate official would surprisingly say she was satisfied that justice had been served, and she would reinstate Bill the embezzler and bid Robert a sad farewell. In fact, if this corporation were to truly exemplify God's justice and grace, Robert's check would be cashed, his job would be taken, and the full gravity of the charge of embezzlement would be hurled at Robert the Redeemer. Bill, well, he'd be back in his job as if nothing had happened. That is the depth of the grace that we receive by our baptism into, not Robert, but into Jesus, the innocent Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world by accepting the sin of the world as his own. This came, of course, to a deadly climax at the cross where Jesus hung there in shame, not just in front of the world, <clears throat> but in front of his Father who agreed to send Jesus into death with all of our sins. And not just the sins of believers, not just the sins of repentant disciples, but the sins of the whole world. Which means every foolish, selfish, hateful, irresponsible thought, word, or deed from all of us. That's a lot of weight to carry lot of weight to pay for. But where do we find the beginning of this journey to the cross? When did Jesus actually pick up our sins? When did he start the process of unburdening, unburdening us from our own iniquities? It was at his baptism, in the waters of the Jordan River, that Jesus put himself in our place, telling John the Baptist, do this, even if he didn't understand it.
baptizing the sinless Lamb of God in order to fulfill all righteousness, taking upon himself the consequences of our sins, graciously buying for us a restored relationship with our Heavenly Father. Now on the way to his cross, Jesus told his disciples that they needed to carry their own crosses if they wanted to follow him. But in Calvary, Jesus never said to them, now plant your crosses in the ground and climb up them and die with me. No, he said of the worst sinners, the ones who even nailed him to the cross, the ones who railed at him in mockery, he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. The crosses that we carry, the crosses that Jesus spoke of, are empty at the foot of Jesus' cross. We are never asked to atone for our own sins because we simply cannot do that in God's eyes. We bring no payment valuable enough to turn us from sinners into saints. So how can we enjoy the fruits of Jesus' labors? all of his sufferings, his death, his burial, and even participate in his resurrection. Well, thanks be to God, it is in the gentle waters of holy baptism. That's where. This very graceful, painless, loving application of water and the word is where the redemptive work of Jesus is poured over us, and our sins are washed away. And nowhere in Scripture is this made more clear than in St. Paul's letter to the Romans. St. Paul writes, Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. This is the very essence of what Christ means for us. Giving us what is rightfully his and taking upon himself what has come from us. It's what he was accomplishing in every act of his ministry. What he did at the outset of his public ministry, when he stepped into the baptismal ministry that John the Baptist was carrying out at the Jordan River, was the precursor to the cross, where he and he alone would sweat and bleed and die in the place of sinners who now receive the benefits of the cross without any of its condemnation teaching about the sacrament of holy baptism. Dr. Martin Luther takes us back to that moment of our Lord's own baptism. Luther writes, that is the mystery which is rich in divine grace to sinners, wherein by a wonderful exchange our sins are no longer ours, but Christ's. And the righteousness of Christ, not Christ's, he has emptied himself of his righteousness that he might clothe us with it and fill us with it. He has taken our evils upon himself that he might deliver us from them. In the same manner as he grieved and suffered in our sins, we rejoice and glory in his righteousness. There is a Good Friday hymn that asks us the question, were you there when they crucified my Lord? And the answer is no, we weren't there. But we were there when Jesus took us into his righteousness and our baptisms because he was there to receive our sins in his baptism. John the Baptist recognized that he had no business calling Jesus to repent of his sin because he had no sin to repent. And like all of us, John the Baptist, that day he was the one in need of forgiveness. None of us has loved God with all of our heart and soul, our mind and our body, nor have 
many of us loved our neighbors truly as ourselves. For all of these sins, we truly deserve the wrath of our holy God. But God so loved the world, and Jesus so faithfully fulfilled that love, that we have been invited to come to the redeeming water of baptism instead of to the cross of suffering or the tomb of death. All of this makes us brand new people. And not just once, but every single day of our lives, we live in the grace of that baptismal water that we share with Jesus. Have we sinned and have we spoiled that righteousness? Well, just remember, this is a continual washing. Have we forgotten our Lord and strayed from the vows of faithful discipleship to him? Well, remember, Jesus reconciles us and restores us daily to himself. Holy baptism is the beginning of a beautiful relationship which depends not on us, but on the grace and the faithfulness of Jesus Christ, our Lord. You can call it propitiation, vicarious atonement, forensic justification. There are a lot of other academic descriptions of what goes on. But we just need to know it is a most blessed and happy exchange. With our sins laid on Christ, we now dwell in his holiness. And united with him, there is no doubt that a glorious resurrection with Jesus awaits us. Amen. Amen. Congregation, please stand as we sing the offering. Especially Bill Ayler, Sharon Ayler, Kevin Bruning, Pastor Donnie, 
Nancy Forbes, Denise Jambroni, Dorothy Haas, Marilyn Hollenbeck, Peter Booth, Charlie Landau, Dylan Maines, Ron Madison, Mike Maker, Jan Noah, Emma, Christine Picker, Darwin Poland, Aliana Randall, Norma Raywald, Tom Roll, Nancy Smith, Joseph Anson, and Janet Wagner. That God would provide healing, restoration, and justice according to his good and gracious will. And that he would cause us to rejoice in the everlasting faithfulness of Christ, his servant, who preserves the bruised reed and faithful burning man. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. Lord God, Heavenly Father, you have called your church from every tribe and nation. Grant that your people throughout the world would rejoice in the death and the resurrection of Christ, and live as those who have died and risen with him in holy baptism. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on the earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thy is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Merciful God, we humbly implore you to cast the bright beams of your light upon your church, that we, being instructed by the doctrine of the blessed apostles, may walk in the light of your truth, and finally attain to the light of everlasting life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Our closing hymn this morning, number 603, We Know That Christ Is Raised. Amen.